Hello and welcome to La Rosa Reads. I'm Denise La Rosa and today we are entering our third installment of one star reviews of my favorite reads. Let's talk books. This is a love-hate relationship I have with recording these videos on my one-star reviews of my favorite reads. I'm just feeling a lot of feelings, but I also understand that one of the most beautiful things about the reading experience is that not everything's your cup of tea and what works for you may not work for someone else. So I get that and I embrace that, but I don't know, I get a little spicy when I'm reading these one star reviews. Let's see what this round leads me to do. Last year, I shared with you my favorite reads of 2023, and I'm now going to rediscover those reads through the lens of people who just weren't feeling them at all. First up is the second ending. I'm happy to see that there are not a whole lot of one star reviews, but one is one too many. Let's see what Elaine is saying. Poor writing, no real storyline, and a complete lack of character development make this book an absolute dud. Oh my gosh, I found that the writing was lovely. I thought the storyline was hilarious and multi-layered. Lack of character? There were really vivid characters and not just the protagonists. Like there were a lot of characters with a lot of life. I don't know what book Elaine was reading, but she wasn't reading the second ending. Jamie says... I didn't like any of the characters. Okay. Most of the book reminded me of that scene in Arrested Development where Lucille says, I mean, it's one banana, Michael. What could it cost? $10? Everyone just feels out of touch with reality. But that's what was so endearing about the book. People were out of touch with reality. I mean, if it's not your thing to be into books like that, I could see where this book wouldn't be your vibe. But it was so ludicrous. It was so ridiculous that it made the characters very lovable, in my humble opinion. Oh, here's a DNF. Shalene says, I got 30% into this book and had to DNF. I was so bored and it was so slow. I didn't think it was slow. I mean, it took a while to get to the big moment of the music competition, but I, whatever. I, you can't please everyone. Mm. Kate is not a happy camper. She says, well, there goes several hours of my life I will never get back. You could have always DNF'd. That's not the book's fault. That is all you, boo. So perhaps I should tell you guys what this book is about. Definitely check out my favorite reads of 2023 video for more details. But we have a protagonist who was a pianist in the 70s that was a child prodigy. She is now an empty nester, we're fast forwarding decades and decades. She's an empty nester having a midlife crisis whenever she decides to re-enter the world of being a musician. And she does so in a very big way by entering a competition that's a la The Voice, only except it's for a pianist. And there's gonna be a duel between her and this young up and coming pianist who is the host of this show. That leads to a comedy of errors. There's like a little bit of scandal involved and it's a fun time. At least I thought it was, but as you can see, not everyone did. And then we have a classic by Ann Petrie, The Street. Oh my goodness. I'm starting to feel like I am known in the bookish social media world as someone who just heralds and lifts up and loves the street and encourages other people to read it. So I am already perturbed that there are people out there in the bookish world that don't like this book. What is there not to like? We have this young black woman who becomes a single mother and she wants the best for her little son, Bub. Like, Bub is just already his name. Like, what? what is there not to like? But I digress. She moves into this slum of a place with a slumlord who is super creepy. Scandal follows. It's just um, suspenseful. She finds herself getting so lost into trying to do better for herself and her son that she misses out on what truly is important. And honey, that ending is the ending of all endings. But here are some people who beg to differ. 
All right, Kelsey says, I enjoyed the first few chapters, but after that, it became boring. And I never connected with the characters, nor did I enjoy the narrative style. We jumped from different perspectives, which I didn't realize at the beginning, and it just did not work for me. Just feels like the story isn't going anywhere. The message, too, unfortunately, was beaten like a dead horse. Honey, I don't know what horse you were on, but you were not riding the journey of the street. I think you need to get your life right and figure out what you want from a book because this book, yes, it was slow moving, but it was building and building. And that's what we call suspense, my friend. Okay, Cheryl has a lot to say. I just couldn't stay with this one. I'm over half done and it's so dark with so many grotesque characters. I agree. It was way too depressing to finish. I probably wouldn't have read as much as I did, but didn't have anything else new in the house to read. Honey, there's a thing called the library, boo, or a bookstore. But that's not what we're here to talk about. Cheryl, I will agree with you that grotesque is a word that I would use to describe some of these characters, and that's what made it salacious and delicious and intriguing and all the things. I do agree that this book doesn't really give you and the writing about this book, like the synopsis, the reviews don't really give you a true sense of what the book is really like. It is suspenseful. It's a thriller. There are grotesque characters and I could see you being surprised. And if that's not your thing and you weren't expecting it, I can understand where Cheryl's coming from. Ace. This book didn't ace it for Ace. Ace says, so far the book is pretty boring. I would personally not have chosen to read this book, but I believe as I read more of the book, it will pick up. How are you reviewing the book if you're not done, Bill? Ace, get your life right. A review happens when you're done reading the book. I'm done with him already. I'm clutching the pearls already because we have... A yet another classic. So we've gone from one classic piece of black literature to another with If Bill Street Could Talk. I am nervous and clutching the pearls because James Baldwin is who he is. He is legendary and this book just is so swoon worthy and swept me away. But there are some here, including Rebel, that have some thoughts, quite the opposite thoughts than me. Oh, this is in another language. Bless them. I don't know that language. Is that German? I think it's German. I'm sorry. I can't translate that at this time. All right, Marissa, what are you saying, babe? Story of Tish and Fanny, a young couple whose lives are torn apart after Fanny is falsely accused of raping a woman. To make matters more difficult, Tish finds out she is pregnant. Well, thank you for giving us the synopsis. There were so many reasons why I did not like this book. Okay, reason number one, the C word was used constantly. Okay, number two, Fonny loved Tish so much, but he refers to her as unattractive in front of his friend Daniel. They were young. They had been best friends. He's young. Not trying to excuse, but didn't the rest of the love story let you know how much Fonny loved Tish? Number three, a father tells his daughters to prostitute themselves to raise money for their brother's bail money instead of giving it away for free. Like, of course we don't like these things. If you like the book, it doesn't mean you like these things that are really unethical and foul and wrong, but that's what moves the plot along. And having characters that are unlikable can make you like a book. Just saying. Number four. The Puerto Rican woman is referred to twice as ignorant, but not because of her race. And we have to understand this book was written in the 60s or taking place in the 60s, like language changes. OK, whatever. Let me keep moving. Um, number five, Puerto Rico is portrayed as a third world country. I know Puerto Ricans do not live on top of garbage dumps and slum areas in Puerto Rico are not referred to as 
favelas that would be in Brazil. I realized this book was written in 1974, so times have changed, but I still thought it was awful. Hopefully the movie was better. The movie was amazing! And I'm sorry that this um, reviewer felt that way about the portrayal of Puerto Rico. I would hope that James Baldwin was thinking of Puerto Rico much like in America. You're going to have like Hollywood. You're going to have you know, these affluent suburbs and you're going to have slums and you're going to have, you know, impoverished areas. And I didn't feel for a second that James Baldwin was saying that all of Puerto Rico was in the state that the particular area of the setting took place was in. I didn't get that at all. I'm sorry that this um, individual felt that way. There was a lot to unpack with that one. Sorry, it wasn't for you, but it was for me. Keith, you know how you have to write a 50,000 word paper for school, but you only have 3,000 words after writing it the first time, so you have to add unnecessary words to fill the paper out? <gasps> Please tell me he is not saying that's what James Baldwin did. Oh, Lord, he said this is what this novel is? <gasps> Blasphemy. Too much exposition, too much background, too much fluff that you didn't need to know of. Like, we needed to know and be immersed in the love story of Tish and Fani. I wanted the quote unquote fluff. I needed to be on that journey. Isn't life like, does life, stop it. This is what gets me about people who read books and they're like too much fluff. Like, that's life, right? We don't want life to be cut and dry and be like, I woke up, I got ready for work, I got in my car, I went to work, I had a crappy day, got in my car, went home. Like, don't you want more nuance? Don't you want life to be richer and fuller than that? And you should want a book to be too. Like, whatevs. Okay. Mm. I'm listening to the Audible version, so I don't know how many pages I read, but the first two hours of the book, the only thing that happened was the main character went to see her boyfriend in prison and then came home. That was it. Two hours. That was it. It was so filled with unnecessary information that only... Act, that the only action happened in two hours was the main character went to see her boyfriend in prison and then came home. <sighs> I almost went crazy waiting for some sort of action to happen. This ain't it, boo. This isn't like an action. Like, know what you're getting into. This was a lushly written book. It's going to... It's going to give you all of the things that will have you immersed in the story. <sighs> Whatever. Okay, we're getting down to my top two books that, as far as my top two reads of 2023. <sighs> Can I handle this? Like, this one isn't, like, last year and the year before I was really spicy. This year I'm, like, really sad. Like, these reviews make me really sad. So let's move on to Before I Let Go. All right, Kennedy Ryan had me all in as far as the relationship between Yasmin and Josiah was concerned. These are two people who fell in love in college and went on to have a successful um, owned business, successful life as far as the eye could see, and having two children, a nice home, a nice car, all of the things, and a tragedy tore them apart instead of bringing them closer together. And we're following them along this awkward in between of co-parenting, co-owning a business and wondering if the romance is truly over or if there's more to come. Here we have some one star reviews. Vara says, I wanted to like this book. At first, I was hesitant to pick it up because Colleen Hoover was on the blurb. <laughs> I'm glad to read that blurb because Colleen Hoover would have had me running away as well. Not a fan. All right, I thought there was no way I could like a book being praised by her, and I was right. Okay, so why? The premise of the book sounded good. The story had so much potential if only it had been shortened. Actually showed us the scenes of their marriage when it was good and made me actively believe it was worthy of a second shot. Yes and no, I didn't need that. I felt like you were getting glimpses of what the marriage was like, and their interactions and when Yasmin and Josiah were reflecting and doing that internal dialogue. So I didn't need all the details. Um, plus, they were just super hot and 
physically attracted to each other too. And I think this is a romance book. So you're kind of more into the steam than the like actual relationship. Sorry, that's just the way romance novels work. But I was, I was in, I was invested. All right, so this person says the entire time you're hearing about how good the relationship was and how they were this it couple. And I'm just like, where? How am I supposed to feel for two characters and root for the relationship when I don't see it? Okay, whatever. So she said that's the biggest problem she had with the book. Um, okay, what else is she saying? Oh, she says she's convinced this wasn't a romance book. There was nothing romantic about this besides their sexual tension, which was at times kind of uncomfortable, but that might be just me. I think that might be just you, honey. Like, do you read romance novels? Just saying. Um, I've read, like, have you read Tessa Bailey? You want to be uncomfortable? Read her books. This was, like, not that weird. At times it felt like their relationship was just based on a physical thing. Okay, blah, 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 lady. Um, okay, she loved, loved, loved all the talk about therapy and grief. Okay, but I hated how in the end, Yasmin took the blame for where the relationship went wrong. I don't think she took the blame. I just think she self-reflected and owned. There's, difference, there's a difference between blame and ownership. I think she wasn't blaming herself, but she was owning her role. I also think Josiah was as well. So, girl, please. Like, sorry it didn't work for you, but it worked for me and quite a few others, I might add. Okay, American Sirens. This is the true story of America's first paramedics who were predominantly black men who were a part of the Freedom House EMS team in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This story is harrowing, it's heartbreaking, it's deeply moving. It is one that I would love to see turn into a, a, a film. I think it's worthy of that. I celebrate these men and also the people who rallied behind them and made this moment happen in our history and made this moment happen for better health care, better emergency health care in America. I don't know how you can give this one star. Um, there's one person that gave it one star and had no comment. Yeah, like, what are you going to say about this, Matthew? Like, what is there to say? Nothing. Like, you can't even back up your one star. So we're done with him. Let's journey to the very few two star reviews that we have here. A lot of nothing. Yeah. It's like a zip it, lock it, put it in your pocket kind of moment for you because you have nothing to say. Um, quite frankly, I'm wondering if you don't like it because you just don't like the fact that these were black men who made history. I mean, I'm not one to walk around with a chip on my shoulder in terms of race relations, but like, you're not telling us why you don't like this. I mean, is it the writing? Like, what are you doing? All right, so Alani said they're spoilers. So I'm still gonna venture to their review because they're the only ones who spoke up. I picked this book up for the concept, not the true story. Okay, I'm already turned off. I wanted to hear the stories of the black men who became America's first paramedics. I was not expecting everything else and all the other stuff that really detracted from the story, like about how this came to be. I mean, there wasn't really, a, you got to know the individuals. And I think that's what made me truly invested in the story, not just my curiosity about um, emergency health care, but also knowing who these people were behind this momentous moment in medicine, in emergency medicine, I need to know about the people behind the story. So I don't think it's, it detracted. I think it enhanced the story. I didn't need to delve into Napoleon era emergency medicine. Okay, like it's a medical story. So get over yourself. I didn't even need to hear about Nancy's affair with a married man. I still don't understand what those quick blurbs had to do with the story because it helped you understand Nancy, this woman who became the director of Freedom House to understand like what she was bringing to the job, what she was carrying emotionally. Um, the author's writing is all over the place. I disagree. I think it was beautifully written for a nonfiction book. It was 
storytelling at its finest. It wasn't just telling facts, right? Uh, much like someone with severe ADHD. Oh, no. Don't you even. Seriously. Mm. And no ability to organize notes. This story could have been much better, but this author destroyed it. You know what? I'm going to destroy, destroy your review. You're bringing up a neurological difference. ADHD, you're like, why are you going below the belt? Just close the book and put it away, boo. Well, at least you spoke up because everybody else was radio silent. Probably because you have no facts to back up your feelings and your opinions. Okay, that was an interesting journey this year. I don't know how I feel about this. Um, how do you feel about reading one-star reviews of your favorite reads? Go hop over to Goodreads or the Storygraph, have that experience, and let me know what you think. You can also check out my other one-star reviews of my favorite books, videos. <laughs> Sound a little weird, but you know what I'm saying. You can check out those other videos here as well. And until next time, happy reading and reviewing. Bye.